And then I remember being in, uh, in the sixth form here distinctly. I remember the amount of talent that was in the, uh, the school at the time, and, and particularly on the, the arts and the music, it was fantastic. So it's just great to see it's uh, still going strong in the, uh, in, uh, at English Marks here. I was not one of those talented individuals, but I did work pretty hard, and I've been pretty busy throughout my life. I stand here tonight as, amongst other things, the, the chairman and chief executive of Gus Robinson Developments. It's a major business in the town, and in fact now the region. And uh, um, I inherited the business three years ago under difficult circumstances. So what I propose to do tonight is talk to you about my, my story. I'm going to be very honest with you. I'm going to tell you what's and all. Um, some of you have, have heard this before. You're absolute gluttons for punishment, but thank you for coming back, Mr. Elton. Um, but it's great to see you here. Uh, I'm going to be very honest, and uh, I'll open it up to questions at the end. You can ask me whatever you want, and I will, on, uh, I will answer the questions as frankly as I, as I possibly can. So, I'm the Chairman and Chief, Chief Executive of Gustavus and Developments, but my life before this was something slightly different. people in the audience, um, I remember, it seems like five minutes ago, being in, in your position in school, and with the whole world at my fingertips. And I would say from the outset that the opportunities that lie in front of you guys right now are infinite. The power of being young and the power of being your age with the educations you've had is immense. So the path in front of you may be slightly confusing for you right now. You may not, sure, you may not be sure which way you're, you're headed. And I'm going to tell you my story. This gentleman here, that photograph was taken at the top of the Eiffel Tower, was my dad. My dad was Gus Robinson, uh, the founder and, uh, and, uh, of Gus Robinson Developments. For many of you, you may not know who he is, you may never have heard of him, but uh, he was an influential person both in business and in the community, certainly in, in Hartlepool, and did a tremendous amount for a number of people around the region and, and much further afield as well. He was the single biggest source of inspiration, drive, uh, passion, uh, confidence, and reassurance that I could ever have asked for as a, as a young man. As an adult, he became one of the most destructive forces in my life, and certainly one of the most painful um, players in my life, for sure. And I'm going to be very honest about this whole story and how this, this came to pass. But as a young child, he really did teach me the, the, the importance of going after exactly what you wanted to do in life. That there were no limits, there was nothing that you couldn't do, and it was simply a matter of working hard. Working hard, being in the right place at the right time, with all of the preparation equals luck. And um, he was a big believer in creating your own love through work. But anyway, I was in that school and we used to do a subject called, um, I can't remember what it was called, but it was basically what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, a, a bunch of career advice and, and, and um, an education along those lines. And I remember the teacher saying to me, all right, class, write on a piece of paper, what do you want to be when you grow up? And this is a God's honest truth story. So I wrote on a piece of paper, five pilots, and all of the kids, and I folded it up, and all of the kids gave their answers to the teacher. And the teacher was reading them out, and he got to mine, and he said, Mr. Robinson, come and stand up here. And I thought, fantastic, he loves me. I'm going to get an A, I'm the first day in my life, and I'm going to get one today. So I, I stood up, and he, uh, maybe stand in front of the class, true story, said, uh, Mr. Robinson thinks he's better than everyone else. Mr. Robinson wants to be a fighter pilot. And he looked at me and he said, go sit down and write something sensible. And I was, I think, 13, 14 years old. So I thought, right. So I went down, bad idea writing that. So I sat down, I scribbled again, I took it back up and it said, I want to be a fighter pilot. And that teacher kicked me out of the class and he made me do laps of the playground in the pouring down rain. It's not like in class at all. It was <laughs> completely different. But it was pouring down rain. I remember all the kids in the classes, I'm sure all of you were knocking on the window going, you're a loser. And I thought, that's a, that was a really bad day for me. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because it ignited something inside of me, which was a drive, which became a fire, which became a fury in the pursuit of something that I wanted to do. Um, I was faced with a, a choice at that point. Do I go to university or do I go and, and pursue this this, uh, this um, passion of mine to go fly airplanes for the Royal Air Force? 
most people had gone to university uh, before me, but to win a scholarship in those days was really, really rare. And uh, so I elected to take the opportunity, join the Air Force directly from school, and I went off to the Air Force Academy and, and started training. As I was going to the Air Force Academy, I thought I'll get there, day one, pack, unpack my bags, day two they'll give me keys to an aeroplane and off I'll go, I'll be in, in, into the flying training system. So I got there, I unpacked my bags and day two I was doing this. And it was nothing like flying aeroplanes. Um, but I started a process that would be the beginning of a journey that would ultimately lead me to, here, to be here today. So I managed to graduate from Cranwell after about a, a year of training and I eventually got into the flying training system. Now the flying training system uh, is, is brutally ruthless. I mean, it, it is, uh, there were 24 of us that started the, the training system um, on the track to be fast jet pilots. At the end of, uh, I think, four, four and a half years, there were four of us left. So pretty selective process to go through. We started life off in the, uh, the Slingsby Firefly and we're learning the basics of, of how to fly an aeroplane, how to go up, down, left, right, what happens if the engine fails, what do you do? We started to do uh, navigation, learning to read a map and a compass. We'd also start to take those leadership lessons and start to fly as part of a formation. So we'd get used to doing this stuff, standing up in front of two people, which at the time could have been terrifying, and talking to them, presenting plans, and executing a mission plan, and debriefing that mission plan. All lessons that we start to build on, very basic lessons, but lessons that you carry forward in life. We'd also do the more cool stuff, which is, as you see by the airplane, we'd start to learn to fly this airplane upside down. We'd do loops, we'd do rolls, we'd do spins, we'd do stuff which was just playing when we were kids at the time. And I didn't realize at those, at those early stages that they were actually building blocks for something which would become much more sinister. So this course was a year, uh, fundamentally a year long. Um, I managed to graduate from that by the skin of my teeth, I believe. Um, but did get out at the end and then went off to RAF Valley in Anglesey. Um, Anglesey is an island uh, on the north coast of Wales. There is literally nothing to do there except look at Mount Snowdon and learn to fly airplanes, which is why they put us there, keeps out of trouble. So we go there and it's the first time we're exposed to flying a jet. And believe me when I say, when, the, when you start to fly a jet and that propeller is not in front of you, it's kind of like being on the end of a broomstick. There's a little piece of, of glass in front of you, and that's all that is between you and the outside world. And all of a sudden now, you're learning to fly an airplane that travels around at 500 miles an hour. But that course was about six months. We finished at the end of that course, and I, I finally, after about three years, three and a half years at that point, get the, the RF wings. The culmination, or so I thought, at the time of, of everything I'd worked for. But not so fast. So I finished the, the training there and they moved me across the road and now we start to take the airplane and we start to do something a lot more sinister. And it's the first time we're exposed to taking that airplane and doing fundamentally what it is designed to do. And the bottom line is, we're there to kill. I made it through that training system and popped out the other side and I moved to RF Leeming. And at RF Leeming, you get to the front line and these boys really are the guys that go out and do the the, uh, the, the job day to day. So a very serious place to be. Well, they took the job very, very seriously. Now my timing was absolutely exquisite in one sense and absolutely horrendous in the other sense because I got to the, uh, the squadron and became what we call combat ready, I capable of going to war in August of 2001. And in September of uh, 2001, I was, I just bought my first apartment, I was in Harrogate, and I was under the kitchen fixing the, uh, the sink at the time. And my friend called me, he said, well, turn the news on, what are you doing? I turned the news on, and the Twin Towers were in flames in, uh, in New York. And I looked, and I was aghast, because I realized at that moment, my life had changed forever. Now, God didn't give me many skills as a human being, but it turned out that I was actually pretty good at flying airplanes. Uh, and in 2004, um, I was given the opportunity of a, of a lifetime to go to something called Royal Air Force Fighter Weapons School. And Fighter Weapons School is essentially uh, Top Gun. So this film I'd watched all these years ago in a bar in Corfu, age 14, 10 years later, I was being, sorry, uh, 13 years later, I was being given the, uh, the opportunity to, to go to this, to this school. They take four, place, uh, four pilots every year, and it is to this day the most difficult course I've ever done in my life. Uh, when you go to, to Top Gun, or to weapons school, you get there and you think you're pretty good. I was actually 
the youngest guy to ever go do it. And when I look back and reflect, it was probably way too early in my career because I got through this course by the skin of my teeth. I was very talented with an airplane, but I didn't have the, the requisite experience to just fundamentally understand the bigger air picture of what was going on and how I took my place in the bigger uh, battle space. It was a big, 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 big line curve for me. But when I got there, I was full of my own self-importance, full of self-belief, and I thought I was the man. And they got there, and within a week, I knew I was absolutely not the man. In the grand scheme of things, I sucked at my job. I was not very good at all. And these guys basically kicked me around the sky for six months. So we came down from a mission cycle. We'd all arranged to meet in the bar one night. We were all having a few pints, and the squadron commander called the room to attention. And we listened, and he said, hey, listen, guys, you know Dan has been put forward for this F-18 exchange. Well, we have an announcement to make. And I thought, jackpot, this is my job. This is it. I've made it. He said, well, you know, Dan's worked very hard. He's gone to Top Gun. He's been through some adversity, blah, blah, blah. You'd expect him to get this exchange. Well, sadly, on this occasion, he hasn't been given this exchange. And I was devastated. I remember standing there with my Guinness and my, my lips started at the wall. I was thinking, oh, my God, what else now? He has not been given this exchange on this occasion. And I'm telling you this because I don't want it to let you put off, put you off going to apply to courses like Top Gun that everyone's scared of doing because of the high failure rate. But on this occasion, he hasn't been successful. And I remember I couldn't speak. And everyone was, you know, heads bowed, doing their best, patting me on the back. And he said, hang on a second. He said, there is a reason he hasn't been selected to fly the F-18 for the United States, maybe. His mind is picked up. And he said the reason he hasn't been selected to fly F-18s for the United States Navy is he's just been selected as the first person in the world outside of the U.S. to go do this. This is the F-22 Raptor. The F-22 Raptor is the most advanced combat airplane on the planet. It is probably going to be the most advanced manned combat airplane that's ever made uh, in, in, in combat aviation. My time at Langley came to an end in 2009. This is me flying over the, with the Red Arrows at Langley Air Force Base. And um, I was faced with a, a very, very difficult decision. I was at the top of my game as a military aviator. It's fair to say that I was probably going places in the, in the military. I'd, I'd had a good background, great opportunities, and I was heading in the right direction. But I took the monumental decision to, to leave the military at that point in time. And people often ask me why, why I did that. And the honest answer is, I don't know. Um, but my guts told me to, that it was the right thing to do. My guts told me that it was time to leave. <laughs> I applied to a, uh, a university uh, called Georgetown University, which is a world-class university based in Washington, D.C. And they have partnered with Asadi Business School in Barcelona, Spain, to, to offer up a dual uh, master's degree program in, uh, in business, a dual MBA. At that point in time, I started to come back to Hartlepool as well. And my dad at that point in time, so this was um, 2009, 2010, my dad was tired, and my dad had essentially stepped out of the business uh, a couple of years earlier. Um, and he was not doing very well. So, full disclosure, he'd suffered with a lifelong battle with manic depression. And he was really ill at that point in time. And he said, can you come back to the, the company? I, I really don't know if I can do this much longer. I'm really tired, and I, I need some help. So I came back to the business, and I started to sort of start to step into the business very gently back here. And it was a big adjustment coming back. Uh, from, from the life I've led. Um, one of my classmates in uh, business school had taken a, a, a kind of liking to me in terms of uh, how we were, we, were, we were studying at business school, thought I, I had something to offer his organization. And uh, he worked, he was the chief executive officer um, of a company called Franklin Templeton Investments. And that was the biggest mutual fund manager in the world. And he said, would you like to come work for us? I said, where? And he said, New York City. And I said, done. I'm going. So I said to my dad, listen, dad, I know you want me back in the business, but this is not going to work. I love you as a son. I want to protect our relationship. I'm going to step out of the business. I'm going to go to New York. I'm going to take this job opportunity, which is fantastic. Yeah. So November 15th, 2011, I woke up to the news that my dad had committed suicide. And to say that my world collapsed at that point is, is an understatement.
Ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, um, this journey I've been on has been um, immensely challenging, immensely, re immensely rewarding, and, uh, and full of surprises along the way. You guys, the young people in the audience, are about to embark on fantastic lives and careers and opportunities in front of you. You will come up against adversity in your lives, be sure of that. But the question is, how will you handle that adversity when it's put in front of you? And I hope you'll handle it. Um, in, in, I hope you'll take some lessons from, from today and handle it in a way that I think uh, is, a, is an appropriate way to do it as leaders. Guys, that's all I've got. I know there's been a lot to take in. Um, it's been a busy life, but uh, if there's any questions at all, please feel free to shout out. I'm more than happy to answer anything honestly.